Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth installment of our Denka Design web series. Today, we're going to be talking about successful record analog and digital record taking methods for digital dentures. We previously spoke about how to manufacture these dentures, how to plan ahead and, and create them, the nuances with Denka Design. And then we also discussed how to clinically deliver the trine and the final. And now we're going to talk about impressions. So we're going from, from, from back to front, if you want to see it like that. And I wanted to cover delivery and I wanted to cover design before so you could understand better what is that you need to be looking out for when you take impressions rather than going from impressions all the way to final delivery. So there are three ways that you can take records for Denka design and for the digital dentures. So the first one is the analog traditional way. Everybody is familiar with wax rims. So you've done wax rims before, you've done stone models before. So I, there, there's certain advantages to, to using wax rims. You know, there's less of a learning curve. Everybody's familiar with them. There's, there's less of an error margin on the doctor's end, assuming the impressions are taken properly. The doctor can be sure of, of what the bite and the position and everything is gonna be prior to sending it to the lab or scanning it um, in a lab. So the results are so, somewhat more predictable when it comes to impressions. The disadvantages, of course, is that there's a longer manufacture times because you have to make these wax rims, you have to spend more time making them, or you have to send them to a lab and have the lab make them for you. So that this makes for a lot more appointments and a lot more chair time. And you have to put a face bow in the patient's uh, face. It takes a long time to actually do all that. So that increases the time that you spend at the chair. And, and next month, we're going to be talking a lot about why time is very, very essential and important when you're doing digital dentures and how much a minute or a couple of minutes or an hour can make a difference in your profitability. So stay in tune for that. But for the time being, that is a huge disadvantage. I'm not going to talk more about this because you, you guys all know about that. So I want to go to the second topic, which is another analog way of taking impressions. And this is with the Denka trays. So the Denka trays are a technology that was created by Denka to be able to take all records in one appointment. And the advantages are, of course, you know, there's, there's less number of appointments which help you save time. You don't have to spend the time or money sending these wax rims to be made at the lab. So these trays kind of act like your impression trays in your wax rims. The disadvantage is that there is a little bit of a learning curve over there, not too complicated. And I'm going to cover how to use these trays in depth right now so you can understand them a little better. They are fantastic for those of you who don't have an intraoral scanner and you don't want to struggle too much with, you know, taking impressions and, and, and doing things the old fashioned way. So it sort of helps you gain an edge if you haven't fully switched to digital. Uh, these trays come in pairs of upper and lower for the eventual trays. You also need single arch trays. If you're doing single arches, you can buy them individually. They come in four different sizes, which is extra large, large, medium, and small. They're color coded for your convenience, or you can buy them as a starter kit. So the advantage of a starter kit is that you have everything you need to do eight to 10 cases right off the bat. So you're not going to be missing pieces. You're not going to buy uh, uh, a tray and then realize you needed that single large attachment. It, it'll make sure that you have everything you need. And it also comes with an impression manual, which will help you remember anything I might have mentioned today throughout the process. So you can refresh your mind on how to take these impressions. Now, what you're going to be doing first is you're going to be sizing your tray in the patient's mouth. Um, you're looking, you want to look for about one to two millimeters between the ridges and the sides of your tray or you can kind of match the borders of the tray with the borders of the patient's existing denture to obtain the ideal size. Do not put the denture inside the tray, but actually match the denture borders that would be in contact with the sulcus with the borders of the denture. Once you've identified the correct size, fill that up with heavy body PVS, add a lot in the center and add some on the borders as well, seed it and border mold it to obtain something like you can see on the second picture. And then you're gonna take a hand piece and you're going to be relieving any areas of tray show through and you're gonna do a light body wash. So this is pretty standard procedure for any type of impression that is going to become a denture later on. Everybody should be familiar with this. And once you're done 
with your wash, you would do the same with the lower if you're doing upper and lower. And then we're gonna do something a little bit unconventional. We taught at dental school that once you get those perfect impressions, you, you shouldn't touch them, you shouldn't do anything with them. Well, in this case, we're actually going to cut them. So we're going to take a number 10 or number 15 scalpel blade and we're carefully going to cut through the impression material following the shape of the tray. Kind of like when you're, 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 you're opening a flap where you cut through the gums following the shape of the bone. Well, this is the same thing. So you're just cutting through the impression material and following the shape of the tray from one side all the way to another. And then you're just gonna wiggle that posterior section free. The reason we remove these posterior sections is because we don't want them to get in the way with our tracing. So this picture kind of gives us a little bit of the overview of what I mentioned before about the layers. And one thing that I always try to make very, very clear is once you separate your tray, make sure that the impression is not too thick. So what you want to do when you're taking your impressions, besides making sure that you're applying equal pressure, is that you need to apply a lot of pressure, especially when you're taking that wash or if you need to redo another layer of heavy body, make sure you add as much pressure as you can to try to end up with as little uh, material thickness as possible. Ideally, it should be about four millimeters, um, five, maybe six. You don't wanna go over eight millimeters. And the reason is the, the thicker your material is, the lower that plate that you see at the bottom of the tray is going to end up which means that you're gonna have less vertical space to play with to do your other movements, such as VD measurement and CR measurement. So always try to look out for that material thickness. So here's a short video that is going to show you how this process is done. Um, we're gonna go from all the way to the trace selection to impressions. So we'll see here all the steps that I mentioned, but sometimes it's a little better to have a visual than to just hear it from me. So basically they're just adding the heavy body here, seating it in the mount, and then all the border molding process is going to begin. Make sure it's seated all the way and you apply even pressure, and then do all the border, border molding steps that you learned out in, in school or that you already perfection. Once it's out, look for any areas where the tray is showing through. And as I mentioned, we're gonna take, uh, football shape uh, burr, and we're gonna take our slow speed hand piece and just relieve those areas before we do the light body wash. One really good piece of advice that I can give you is that if you're relieving the borders of the tray, it's always good to add a little bit of heavy body before putting all the light body in. The reason being that if you just relieve the border and add just the light body, it's going to create a dip. Remember, light body is more fluid, so it's not going to build up back to that border. So it's always a good idea to add a little bit of heavy body on the border if you're grounded and then just add the light body. I always like to overgrind rather than undergrind to avoid, you know, having to do that second layer of heavy body or light body and then realize you didn't grind it enough. So that's what it looks like when you're done. You want to make sure all the borders look okay, that everything is fully captured. You do this, you do upper and lower, and then you're going to be separating the trays. So as I mentioned, there's one cut for the upper, and then there's going to be two cuts for the lower. As you can see in the second part of the upper left picture, they're separating the posterior attachments on the lower. And also, when you're trimming these attachments off of the lower tray, make sure you relieve the lingual area of the, from any impression material. This is because, as you can see in the lower right picture, you're going to be putting a central bearing pin on the lower tray, and you need to relieve these little railing or little areas where you're going to connect the central bearing pin. Once the pin is in place, you're going to be taking your vertical dimension. So the pin basically goes up and down to kind of help you establish the correct vertical dimension that you want. So in here is basically just a short video. As you can see, they're just cutting through the material, as I mentioned. Be especially cautious of the middle part of the pallet, especially if your material is too thick. That's usually the part where they don't cut deep enough. So they're having issues trying to wiggle it free. Be very, very careful. Try not to cut your fingers. Uh, keep them away from the area where you're cutting. In this case, that's actually very thick. And then relieve any, any excess of material, especially from the lingual, to expose those notches and then click it in. In this case, they should have removed the posterior attachments as well, which they are now. And you're going to end up with basically the upper tray 
without the posterior attachments and then the lower tray without the posterior attachments as well. So once we're done with that, we need to obtain our ideal vertical dimension. And you can use one of our jog gauges, which is a picture of the, of the little device that you see down there, we call it a jog gauge. This device has a ruler and then it has two parts. So there's the main part, which is curved in, and then there's a lower portion that looks kind of like a, a spoon or a cup. So you assemble them together and the upper part is going to rest on the nose and the lower part is going to rest on the chin. And it has a little arrow. So that arrow is going to help you determine your vertical dimensions. So it's kind of like your old school way where you would put your dots and you would measure, except you don't have to put anything on the patient's face and then you just use this. So you can do these one of two ways. You can either measure and then obtain your existing video from an existing set of dentures and try to match that to where the trays are. As I mentioned, that, that little pin acts like a screw that can go up or down to open or close vertical dimension. Or you can just lower that pin until the patient's lips are barely touching at rest. Now, many people ask me, well, uh, wouldn't that be vertical dimension of rest? And the reason is no, that is not the case. Um, since we have all that impression material, so that is slightly opening the patient down. So by the time the lips actually touch with all that impression material, pushing the lips forward, then that's usually two millimeters less. So we end up with what usually would be video. Again, this is just because the impression material is pushing the lips outward. So they're separating them further. So by the time they touch, that's video and not BDR. In here, we see how they're measuring um, the vertical dimension. And then we're going to proceed to the next section where we're going to be um, talking about CR tracing. But before we go through CR tracing, something's very important is sometimes you'll run out of space. Let's say you want your patient to be at 58 millimeters, but you are at 60 and the trays are already touching you need to make sure that these trays don't touch. And one thing that you can do is either grind the posterior sections or, or the areas that are touching on the tray, if it's a minimal adjustment to kind of take you where you want to be, or slightly open it so the trays aren't touching in any area, and then just let us know by how much you want to close it by. So again, let's say you want the patient at 58 millimeters, but you can only muster 61 millimeters and you cannot close it further. You just need to let uh, Denka know to close by three millimeters. Or if you're designing with Denka Design, keep that note in there, and then you can close vertical dimension with the toggle bar that we discussed during the teeth setup portion of Denka Design. Very, very important, again, to make sure that the trays aren't touching. If they're touching, then your, your CR tracing is going to fail. Now, um, what we're gonna do is we're going to attach one of these easy tracers on the top part, and then we're gonna do one of the three impression taking, record taking, um, CR taking methods. Uh, the first one is called Gothic arch tracing, which is just basically asking the patient to softly bite down and then glide his mandible in protrusive and retrusive positions forward and backwards. And then when they're at the most posterior point, do lateral movements. And that's going to create a very precise arrow that is at its tip is where a CR point is going to be. If the patient cannot do lateral movements because they have TMJ issues, just ask them to do what's called simplified tracing, which is just moving backward and forwards and try to find that most posterior line or more, most, most, most posterior edge, and that would be your CR. If everything fails, just recline the patient in the chair, have the mandible fall through gravity and just ask the patient to open and close and look for that area of most concentrated dots. And that's gonna be your CR point. The red check bite is the least accurate, but that's something uh, sometimes all we can do for certain patients that don't have control over their motor skills. Um, and sometimes what you, when you get tracing, you might get some weird squiggles, like you can see in the diagram on the left, where one arrow is pointing further up and one arrow is pointing further down. You're always going for that most posterior dot, regardless of where these tips of the arrow are. Uh, and then something else that I always like to give advice on is ask the patient to do these movements gently. Sometimes the patients will think that the harder they do it, the more it's going to mark on these um, etch a sketch paper. And the problem is this paper has a layer, a plastic layer. So if you don't like your tracing, you can lift up that layer and you can redo your tracing. 
but sometimes the patients will do it so hard that the plastic portion is going to separate and you won't be able to see any tracing. So you have to remind the patient to do it softly. And then basically, if you are unsure of where your tracing is and just, just take a Sharpie marker and mark that most posterior dot and redo your tracing. And if you end up at that same dot, that's your centric position for sure. As you know, centric is a position that is repeatable throughout several attempts. So that's one way to ensure that you're always there. Another thing that you might want to consider, especially if you have medium or small trace, is to make sure that that red line on the um, EC tracer is further um, past the, the line where the tray ends. So you can ensure that you have enough uh, space to move back without hitting that red bar when you're doing your CR tracing. Now, if you see that your patient actually made a lot of movements and, and nothing registered because he did it too hard, you can still see the tracing on the black carbon paper underneath the clear plastic paper. So you can still see that tracing if you feel like the patient did it too hard. So all you have to do is look for that one point and then find your CR point through that. Once you know where your CI point is, we're going to drill a little dimple. And it doesn't have to be too deep. You might want to make it wide so it's easier to find and about half a millimeter deep. So it, it, the head of the pin locks into place and it, it cannot get out easily. Because what you're going to be doing next is you're going to put those trays back in the patient's mouth and you are going to actually ask the patient to lock into that position. So the bigger the hole is, the easier he'll be able to lock into that. And the deeper it is, the, the more secure it'll be. And then once that happens, we're going to hold the lower tray and we're going to fill out that space with bite registration material to end up with this sandwich-like um, set of upper and lower impressions. So here's a, a little video of how that works. So we just peel off the yellow portion of the easy tracer that turns that into a sticker. And then you're just going to place that sticker on the upper and you're going to ensure that that red line is uh, sticking beyond the posterior section of the tray. And then basically you're gonna put them in the patient's mouth. And again, we're gonna ask him to softly make the protrusive and retrusive movements and the lateral movements. And you're gonna be able to see the CR tracing. In this case, they're guiding the patient a little further back and they're helping him out. If you feel like they're not finding the, 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 the right movements, you can either show them with your mandible and make those movements with your mandible, or you can guide them with your hand. And then you'll see, like, as you can see, there's a very precise arrow and the tip of that arrow is where she's going to drill the dimple. So um, make sure that you're actually ensure that the center of this dimple is right at uh, the, the, sorry, the tip of the arrow is at the center of the dimple. And then you can remove the clear plastic part to have a better view when you're trying to set these um, trays back into the patient's mouth. Sometimes you have to make sure that the tray is in the dimple. So it's easier to find that contrast around the black color than if you have the clear plastic on top of it. So she's going to return these into the mouth and she's going to ask the patient to lock in. Now, it's very important that you're holding the lower tray as you're injecting the PVS material. Otherwise, especially in patients that have very little bone, what's gonna happen is that tray could tilt and it could affect your bite. So always make sure that the trays aren't touching and that the pin is in that dimple and that you're holding that lower tray when you're putting your bite material. Now, when you take it out, you, wanna might, you might wanna examine your impression, you evaluate it, make sure that the, the head of the pin is still on the dimple, that you don't see any separation like you can see in the lower right. Um, this is because the patient bit too hard. So what happened is the tray sort of bent, the impression material copied that, and when the patient stopped biting, it caused a separation. So if you see any of these issues where the pin is not in the dimple or you see that space, it's better to just retake the impression. You would rather spend another 30 seconds retaking that bite than spending a good hour or hour and a half grinding on that trine. So once that's done, this is what you should have. You know, uh, the upper and lower tray should be parallel. They shouldn't be touching one another. You want to make sure that the, the, the head of the pin is in the dimple, that you have all the posterior attachments, the borders look good. None of the tray um, is showing through. So this is roughly what you, what you want to go for when you use the trays.
And the last part is if you're doing an upper denture, you need to take the Dencalip ruler, which is included in the starter kit. You put it on the incisive papilla. You're going to ask the patient to relax their lips. Sometimes they try to help us and they tend to stretch the lip down and see it from eye level. Um, and then write down that measurement. So that, that measurement is going to be asked of you when you're loading it into the Denka Design software or if you ask Denka to design from you. It's always good to get a second pair of eyes. Um, some people, depending on where they're seeing it from, it might look like a different number. So always get a second opinion, just like you do with um, the shades. I'm going to skip this part because it's, it's pretty straightforward, but just wanted to show you that is the incisive papilla for those who are not familiar where that's at. It's a little dimple that would sit between the centrals. And then if you want to do a single arch, you need one of the single arch trays. So basically you would just put bite material on the attachment and copy the shape of the teeth. So as you can see on the left, they're doing a lower denture. So you want to copy the shape of the upper teeth. And then that's just going to be a plate for you to add the EC tracer. And if on the other hand, you're doing an upper denture, as you can see on the right side, you need a lower plate to actually hold that little pin in place so you can do your tracing. That's the only difference between a complete upper and lower and a single arch case. If you're doing single arch cases, always send a stone model of the opposing dentition to the laboratory. Or if you have a scanner, then you can scan it. However, if you do have a scanner, you don't need to go through that process. That being said, if you have an implant over denture, the process is the same. Just make sure the locator abutments are in place. And just the only difference is once you're done with a heavy body, enlarge those holes where the abutments are before you do the light body wash. So you can seat it back easily and you don't struggle trying to refit it in and have it locked in place. These are examples of things that you should not be doing. You should not have the trace touching or very thin borders of areas of trace show through. You wanna make sure that light body covers everything and there's no areas of heavy body that are sticking or uncaptured on, on or everything else. Sometimes people forget to use light body and they just use heavy body. So these are just things that you might wanna look out for when using the Denka trace. Again, one thing I always like to stress out is design cannot come from nothing. So the software is not magic. It's not going to find out everything that you did wrong and fix it for you. So if you're not doing enough border molding, your borders are going to be overextended when you get your design back and you're trying back. If you take the wrong bite, then the bite is shifted. When the design is done, the midlines are going to be aligned, but once you put it in the mouth and everything is moved, your midlines are going to be misaligned. And that is because it's being designed the way you send the records. So what digital does is it actually reduces the probability of error on the lab side. But if you send an impressions where the, the bite is off by one millimeter, then the bite is going to be off by one millimeter when you get your trying. So that is the beauty or 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 the, the magic of, digital is that you now have a little bit more responsibility on your end, but there's less degree of, of issues on the left side. So now you're hundred percent responsible from what you get. If you do a good job with the impressions, there's no reason why the trains should not be pretty, pretty accurate. Last part, don't forget to take the, the shades. Um, if you haven't done so, it's highly recommended that you purchase a Denka 3D printable material shade guide if you're going to use Denka printable materials. This is because the shades are pretty spot on with Vita, but they're slightly off when it comes to gums. And this is because um, your, your, your gum shades on the Lucy Tone have the fibers and they're, they're, they don't let color through. But with 3D printable materials, they have to be semi-translucent so they can be cured by the laser and also so they could mesh up with the color of the gum. So there's a slight variation between the 3D printed uh, Lucy Tone colors, sorry, the 3D printed colors for the gums and the Lucy Tone colors. So always make sure you have a Denka shade guide. And that's pretty much it when it comes to the Denka Trace. As you can see, there's a little bit of a learning curve that they, they help you save a lot of time. But if you have an internal scanner, this is the part that you're going to love because you can pretty much go impression-free or, or go as impression-free as it can get. And I'm going to show you an amazing way that you can do things if you have an internal scanner and if the patient has any existing dentures that you can use. So the biggest advantage of this is that you, you can probably finish up a case in about half an hour 
from the moment the patient sits in the chair from up to the moment that the patient gets up the chair and, and you finish the first appointment. The disadvantages of using interval scanners are not in the technique I'm going to show you, but in the fact that you need to know how to use the interval scanner. You need to be familiar with how interval scanners work so you avoid getting double layers, so you avoid getting holes on your scan. We already discussed on the previous lecture how important it is not to have double layers or not to have any holes. So you have to be very careful that you're not moving back and forth with the scanner. If you return to an area that you already scanned, there's a very high chance that you're going to create a double layer and that not only causes issues when you're designing, but also it's going to confuse you when you're trying to design it yourself, not knowing exactly which of the two layers is the one you wanna keep. So the way this works is very simple. You're going to take the patient's existing denture and you're gonna put heavy body on the borders. You might need to use PVS adhesive. And then basically you're going to do the border molding in the patient's mouth. And then once you're done with the heavy body, you're gonna add a, li a light body layer sit it back in the patient's mouth and you're going to redo your border molding steps. And at this point, you're going to take your vertical. The reason being, you're going to scan a bite and you're going to scan everything. So your impression material is now opening the vertical dimension. So you need to make sure how much it was opened by so you can then close it by later on. Another very important thing is that carefully, you need to expose the teeth area. Um, we already covered this in our last session. So do remember that without the same matching points in the bite than in the upper intaglio, you are not going to be able to match this. So you have to scan the teeth when you're scanning the intaglio and also on the bite so you can align them. Whether you're scanning or it's going to align them by themselves with the same software or whether you're scanning a bite separately, it's still important to, to show at least some of the teeth so the scanner can make the matching and find the same points. So once that is done, you can scan the intaglio of the denture, and then you can do the same with the lower, and then you put both dentures in, or if you're doing a single arch, scan the opposing dentition, and then you're going to take a bite. You can either hold the patient in position and scan it without any bite material, or you can put PVS material if you feel like the patient is moving too much and you wanna keep him steady. So once you're done, basically you're ready to finish. So this is, this is a great way to, of doing it. So I'm gonna show you a video and you can see how this is done step-by-step. Step. All these videos are online by the way. So if you ever need, like you feel you need to revisit them, just go to our video section and you can see all of them. So again, heavy body on the borders, border mold, and then we're gonna do a light body wash. So in here you can see just, you know, a thin amount is fine. Most of these dentures are actually pretty, pretty um, fitting pretty snugly, unless they're very, very loose. You might need a little bit more material, but usually, you know, that amount is enough. And then you do your border molding steps. And then they're going to be doing the light body section. So only a thin layer of light body is necessary. I feel like they're adding a lot here on this video. So only a, a, a tiny, tiny, layer is necessary. So they're seeding it and they're doing all the border molding steps. And then carefully, so you don't scratch the patient's denture, you're going to expose the teeth and then you are going to be scanning. So as you can see in here, they're scanning the intaglio. So you can just extend to the borders and they're scanning the entire denture that way. So once you're done, you're basically gonna have three SDL files, maxillary, mandibular, and bite, unless they're already pre-articulated. If they're pre-articulated, then it's just upper and lower. And again, you know, the bite has to have matching areas. So don't forget about that. If you have something like this, you're not gonna be able to match it. So that's what we discussed last time. Always make sure there's no double layers and beware of holes as well. Now, many people ask me, can I scan them out directly? And the answer is yes. However, there are some nuances to this. I wouldn't recommend it because you're not doing any border molding. And if you're not doing any border molding, you're very highly uh, um, going to wind up with either overextended borders or the denture is gonna have retention issues. So you wanna avoid doing that. And then the other thing is taking the bite is complicated without 
you know, if you have to, a fully edentulous patient, taking the bite is complex. Basically what the scanner does when they take the bite is they try to find same surface as what they scan in the maxillary and mandibular. And you're not gonna find that if you're trying to have a bite. And you can't keep the patient with both arches in the air. So you actually need to do some sort of a bite block or use your fingers to kind of keep it in place. And then when you're trying to go from the upper to the lower arch, the scanner always gets confused and disconnects. So it's really, really difficult to do it um, like this. I don't, uh, I don't really recommend it using the method of scanning the, the arch uh, and the denture is a little better. Um, where you can actually do it is with one exception, which is with immediate dentures. So if with immediate dentures, you have a reproducible bite, meaning there's areas where your teeth are biting, or you can have the patient close down and have the, teeth, the upper and lower teeth actually touch the opposing gums, you can do that. You can scan the upper, you can scan the lower, and then you can scan your bite, and you can send that to be designed. The reason I'm not that concerned about borders on an immediate denture is because you're gonna find yourself having to reline this denture several times throughout the first month or month and a half. So you're really not, not that concerned. Of course, you want a really good fitting denture, but the, the bone is gonna be reabsorbed pretty quickly. So you can always reline this denture and reline your borders when you do your, your, your soft liner relines. Or, you know, if you still don't want to do that, you can always go with the analog way for immediate dentures, which is just taking an upper and lower stone models, take a bite, send it out. So that's it about um, record taking for both digital and analog ways for everything from conventional dentures, immediate dentures, and implant over dentures. Again, if you have any questions, just type them right now in the chat and we're gonna cover them. Otherwise, I thank everybody for coming. And if you need to reach me, you can always reach me at the at the email address and phone number that you see in front of you. So I'm gonna give a moment to see if there are any questions. And if there's not, I thank everybody for joining us. Thank you so much. So it looks like there are no questions. So I wanna thank everybody for coming. See you next month. <laughs>